this privilege. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your anointing. We thank you for your presence that's in this place. Father, as we come tonight, God, we pray that you would bless our time together. God, we pray, God, that you would look on us, God, as we share this word. Open up our hearts to hear. God, for every man that's in this house, God, make us better after this moment. God, let your word go forth with power. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts, let it be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the people of God shout amen. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, let's give God praise. You may be seated. You may be seated in the presence of our God. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. We give God praise for every person that's here tonight. To, to the pastor of this house, Dr. Cheryl Power. Come on, let's give her a standing ovation. Amen. One of God's greatest gifts. Amen. Who is sought after around this world. We honor her giftings. We honor her leadership. And most importantly, we honor her heart for evangelism. Amen. Amen. Coming. Amen. To call your city, making an impact. Thank you, Pastor Powell. Amen. For your leadership. Amen. And to my classmate and her husband, we honor you. Thank you, classmate. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to come. And to all the preachers and pastors tonight, we honor your giftings to the kingdom of God. A portion of our men from First Baptist is here. Amen. My deacon is here. My ministers are here. Amen. They've come tonight. Amen. I see they took their hats off. Amen. Amen. But they're here tonight with us. Amen. And my brother-in-law said, Pastor Raymond Baker from the El Bethel. Amen. Tabernacle. Amen. And to my wife in her absence. Amen. She sends her love. Amen. Let's get right into our assignment. Nehemiah chapter number two. Amen. Verses 11 through 18. Amen. A very familiar passage of scripture. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number two. And to the musicians. Good to see you, Sticks. Amen. Good to see you. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number two. I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible, verses 11 through 18. Amen. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't have it, say, I need to go to Sunday school. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number 2, verses 11 through 18. It reads like this. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Verse 14 says, then I moved on toward the fountain gate in the king's pool, but there was still not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally, I turned back entered the valley gate. Verse 16 says, the, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or to the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. And I said to them, you, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be in disgrace. Verse 18 says, And I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. Then they began the good work. Amen. I want to talk just for the next couple of moments from this idea positioned to cover. Positioned to cover. Early on in this sermonic presentation, I, I want to create some, some tension. And here's the tension that I want to create. We cannot cover what we're not willing to assess, respect, through the means of discernment or through the means of close watch of our current climate. I know there's an obligation for us to cover our families, to cover our churches, and to cover other entities that need covering. Here it is, but if we're not willing to really assess, respect where the threat is coming from, we'll leave that which needs to be protected in a vulnerable position. Here's one of the reasons I believe Satan or the devil likes to keep us distracted, men preferably, because he knows that when we're on guard, focused and spiritually aware of what's going on around us, will be able to combat his forces and the danger that he's capable of causing. 
I also believe he uses distractions as a tool to keep us from paying attention to those endangered at risk areas that are directly connected to us. And that's why people of God, it's vitally important that we're on guard and aware and focused so we can always identify where Satan is lurking. We oftentimes are plagued with spiritual complacency because we tend to forget the value of growing in grace, the value of growing in God and growing in our spirituality that develops our as we, that develops us as watchmen on the wall. And I believe God wants us to assess and expect, inspect rather, what's going on around us so we'll know how to approach him through the means of prayer and intercession. God wants us to avoid distractions, learn the value of focus, of being focused, learn the importance of spiritual sensitivity so we'll always be aware and in position to cover the individuals that are assigned to our lives. And tonight, I believe my assignment is to challenge every, every male in this room to see the importance of being positioned, being in position to cover, cover suggesting being on guard watching out for, having a discerning eye for the intent of the adversary, possessing a spiritual sensitivity to see what's at work behind the scenes, ready to protect against potential threats that may, be, that may have the capacity to dismantle our families, destroy marriages and wipe out our children and dismember the institution of church. Position to cover is when, watch this, the heart is manifested through one's actions to fight against any possible foes that may be on the horizon. And is there anybody in this room tonight that says, I'm positioning myself to cover, to cover the church, to cover our families, to cover our children, to cover our community? And I believe God in this particular season, he's petitioning us, classmate, to be in position not only as men, but as the men and, and women of God. Watch this to cover that which we are assigned to. And I believe when we leave tonight, we'll have a better understanding of the value of being in position to cover. Nehemiah, who, who bears, who names, watch this, is on this particular book. Watch this, he is in position to cover. When you read this, read this particular book, uh, of this Old Testament historical book, what's obvious is that a man who's, who is in, in position, watch this, to cover those that have returned from exile, and watch this, and they are accessible to the enemy's attack. Nehemiah's implied core values are housed in his movement. It can be identified of one that has this care and concern for the ones that he has been assigned to. And his example is a model for us to follow in this room so we, watch this, can avail ourselves to be in position, put position as watchmen on the wall to cover those who are assigned to us. And as I was writing this, the Lord spoke to me and said, prioritizing the protection of others is the formula for covering. I'll say it again, prior prioritizing the protection of others is the formula for covering. And one of, one of the implied uh, ideas of covering is this protective nature against danger and situations that pose to be harmful. And the idea uh, of covering is this concealment, this sheltering from peril and endangerment. And so the true essence of covering is, watch this, prioritizing the protections of others that the Lord has obligated us to. It is a sad indictment on the church that things are happening around us because we are not in position to cover those who are assigned. Our sons are losing their lives. Our daughters are being led astray. Our families are falling apart because we have not prioritized this thing called covering. And I believe tonight that the Lord is going to raise up men who are taking seriously this idea of covering. Somebody shout prioritize. We need to prioritize our covering so that we can then be the voice that the community needs to hear. We need to prioritize our covering so our sons will not end up in jail. And so I understand what the statistic is, but I believe the Lord has commissioned us to position ourselves to cover. And so when the story opens up in chapter one, it exposes Nehemiah's a response to the actual report that disclosed the condition of those that who had returned back from Jerusalem, uh, returned to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. 
Bible says Nehemiah is in Sidel of Susha. He gets word from one of his brothers that the Jewish remnant had survived exile, but yet they are in trouble and they're in disgrace. And then he gives more details about their condition. Uh, the, the, he gets word that the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. So this is extremely concerning because that which is designed to protect those that have returned is no longer or no longer has the functioning capacity to do so. They're living in Jerusalem, but they're living on dangerous territory because the walls have come down and the gates, watch this, have been burned with fire. And so meaning returners are vulnerable and susceptible, watch this, to the invasions of their enemies. And so they have endured, watch this, 70 plus years of captivity only to return to Jerusalem to be accessible to their enemies. There is no adequate safety for those who have returned from being in bondage with Nebuchadnezzar. There is no adequate safety for them that have come out of the, uh, this Babylonian captivity. And upon hearing this, Nehemiah's first response is found in verse number four of chapter number one. Nehemiah says, after hearing this, Dr. Cheryl, the first thing that I did was I sat down and I wept. After hearing what had happened or what were the conditions were, I, I sat down and I wept. And so remember, he's not in the same place with the, with the returning people from exile. So he's not vulnerable to the attacks, but, but because he is so concerned about the plight of the people, watch this, the first thing he does is he wept. And so here's a truism that we learn about Nehemiah's weeping, that a compassionate heart weeps for critical condition. Let me say it again, that a compassionate heart weeps for critical condition. It's a sad indictment that when we see uh, what's happening in our country, what's happening outside of this pandemic, I'm talking about what's happening to us as people, that what's happening to our black men, uh, it causes us to weep. It causes us uh, to shed tears because it seems as if we're the ones that's being picked on. And I've discovered as I'm watching the news and I'm watching things take place, uh, I'm like Nehemiah. All I can sit down and, and, and do is weep because of the condition or the critical conditions of our time. And so what the Lord has instructed me tonight to do is this to charge us that's sitting in this room that we need to be concerned about what's going on around us. We need to be more considerate and more prayerful about the environment in which he has called us to. And Nehemiah said, when I heard about the condition, all I could do was weep. And I know when we look at today, days climbing what's going on all we can do is weep but I believe the Lord is raising up men and women of God that's going to stand on the wall and become watchmen watch this so we can cover those that need to be covered and after Nehemiah weeps the Bible says he mourned fasted and prayed concerning the people asking God for favor from the king so he can go back to, to, to Jerusalem and be of aid. The fast forward the story, Nehemiah of course is granted favor by the king that he was serving. Watch this, he's granted favor to go back. And so watch this, Nehemiah is positioning himself to go back to Jerusalem, or go to, back to, go to Jerusalem so he can cover the people of God. And so his passion for the people, uh, uh, the, the, the living conditions is his driving force. Uh, Nehemiah says the walls have fallen and the gates are burned down. And so it's my desire and my passion to go where they are so I can put them in a different type of environment. So Nehemiah's heart would not allow him to leave those persons uh, that, that he's concerned about in the condition that they're in. And so when he gets to Jerusalem in chapter number two, the Bible says Nehemiah inspects the wall. And he goes throughout Jerusalem examining the damage. He goes through the valley gate, through the jackal wall, to, to the dung gate, probing to see uh, which part of the wall or the gate lays that lies in ruin. Nehemiah wanted to know uh, what had been broken down and what uh, had been burned with fire. And Nehemiah, watch this, a uh, classmate, he gets this visual uh, uh, that gives him the answers uh, that would help him to reposition the, these particular people in a better situation. 
And Nehemiah is examining the walls. He's, he's walking around. He's getting a visual. He's noticing uh, that the gates have been burned with fire and that the walls uh, have come down. He's getting uh, this visual. And so here's what I want to suggest before I transition. Uh, we will not know where the damage is if, we do, if we're not willing to inspect uh, where the damage lies. Uh, we will not know where the damage is uh, if we don't get ourselves out of the four corners of our wall and inspect where the damage lies. And so somebody shout, show me where the damage is. I need to know where the damage is. I got, I got some daughters uh, and I got to make sure that I'm inspecting their lives so they can't walk around being damaged. I got, a, I got sons. I got to make sure that they're whole. I got, I got church members that I got to cover. And I got to know if there is damage, show me where the damage is. Uh, because when I know where the damage is, I can intercede. Somebody shout intercede. Uh, yeah, I can intercede. I can pray. I can go to God. I can uplift them in prayer. I can give them sound counsel. But somebody needs to know where is the damage? Because I do believe that damage does exist. But the people of God, we've been so out of place that we don't even know where the damage is. But we need a Nehemiah spirit. We need to go and inspect where the damage is. Nehemiah, he's walking around and he's seeing, watch this, that the walls have been torn. We all know the story of that the gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah says, I'm inspecting the damage. I'm expecting the damage because I need to see where the work needs to be done. And Nehemiah says, I'm challenging you, Pastor Spry, to inspect the damage in your own context. Because you best believe if you live long enough, damage is somewhere around you. And if we're not inspecting the damage, people will live in unforeseen conditions. So here are two, two important principles that I want to suggest about position to cover. First thing that I want to suggest about being in position to cover men is that your level of focus determines how you move. First thing that I want to suggest is that your level of focus determines how you move. Verses 14 through 16 says, then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for the mount to get through. And Nehemiah says, so I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back re-entered the valley through the valley gate. Verse 16 says, the officials did not know where I had gone or what, what, what I was doing because as yet I had not said nothing to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, or the officials, or any others who were doing the work. Watch this. What's described in verses 13 through 15 are these different areas that Nehemiah is inspecting to see where the damage is located. Because these three verses, Nehemiah mentions at least six places that houses the damage. First place he talks about is the valley gate. Somebody shout the valley gate. He talks about the valley gate and upon investigation, Nehemiah says this particular gate suffered great damage and it was totally destroyed. And he goes from the valley gate, watch this, to the jackals well, noticing uh, uh, its destructions, its destructions and ruins. And scholars, uh, scholars argue that this may have been the water supply, but yet it was damaged. Then he goes to the dung gate where, uh, that was southwest corner of the wall of Jerusalem uh, that was noted for its disposal of rubbish and dung. And Nehemiah is moving. Then he sees the walls of Jerusalem, which he noticed have been destroyed by fire. And so he moved to examine the, found, the foundation or the fountain gate, rather, and the king's pool. Nehemiah is examining these walls with great detail, and his level of focus is identified with how he's moving through these different locations. Because remember, he has to know where the work needs to be done. And Nehemiah says, I can't be bothered with distractions. I got to see where the work is done. And so Nehemiah, he's focused. He's moving through the era, these areas of Pastor Baker with intentionality. He's focused and he's determined and he, he's identifying the, the, this dilapidated area. And so in this portion of scripture, all that matters to Nehemiah is where the damage is. Nehemiah says, I'm just focused on where the damage is. And so Nehemiah teaches us that our 
level of focus determines how we move. He teaches us that when you are in your position to cover, your movement is determined by how focused you are. And so we are priests of our homes, leaders in our communities, intercessors in the church. And you can tell how focused we are when we move with these particular ideas. And so listen, when you are focused to move, we can move in power. Somebody shout power. Yeah, when you're focused, uh, you move in power, power over the enemy, power to command him to get out of our, 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 our homes. Uh, we move in power, calling him uh, out of our children's lives, move in power uh, so then our, our members can walk in freedom. We move uh, in authority when we are focused. Uh, we can take our families back. Uh, we can be a significant voice in our communities. Uh, we can move, watch this, with intentionality. We can move in ways that intimidate our adversary and so Nehemiah says I'm moving with intentionality I'm focused because I need to know where the work is I need to know where the work needs to be done and is there any man under the sound of my voice that's moving with focus that's paying attention to your surroundings that's paying attention to who you are connected to because when you move watch this with a focus mentality nothing gets behind you nothing gets beside you. Nothing can uh, come your way and you not recognize what it is. Uh, and so what the enemy likes to do, he likes to distract us. Yeah, let me be transparent for a moment. I didn't just start preaching Dr. Sherwo. Uh, there was a time in my existence uh, where I was distracted by everything that was coming my way because the enemy knew if I would be focused uh, and I would walk uh, in the Lord's will, I would move uh, a certain way. But when, he, when I was able to get out of the enemy's hands, and move in the area in which God had called me to. I was able to walk in power. I was able to walk in authority. I was able to be a leader in my home. I was able to speak life into my children. Somebody shout focus. Yeah, we need to learn how to focus. If you're going to be positioned to cover, you got to learn how to walk in focus. So Nehemiah says, watch this, I'm almost done. Nehemiah says, I'm examining the walls and my level of focus is, is, is dictating how I move. Nehemiah says, I'm, I'm going through the fountain gate, the king's pool. I'm, I'm walking through because I need to know where this damage is. Secondly, we discover, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, about positioning to cover. Is, watch this. It, positioning to cover begins with the passion to change the narrative. It begins with the passion to change the the narrative. Watch verse 17 uh, through 18. The Bible says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And so we no longer will be in disgrace. Verse 18 says, so I told them about the gracious hand of my God that was on me and what the king had said to me. And watch this. They replied, let us start rebuilding the wall and so they began this good work and so from the opening of this particular book what's recognizable is the zeal and the passion of Nehemiah uh, in chapter 1 Nehemiah communicated uh, that he wept prayed and fasted for those had, who had returned from exile because of the condition they were in they were accessible to the attacks of their enemies but Nehemiah knew that something needed to be done and I believe he felt within himself uh, that their story could not end like this. Uh, his passion pushed him to go to the place uh, to examine the damage that had been done uh, so he could reveal what had been destroyed. And so once again, Nehemiah had a passion to change the nature of their story. And the story uh, uh, of their lives was, watch this, they were in a defenseless, vulnerable position. Uh, and based on Nehemiah's action, uh, this part of the story needed to be changed. And so when he starts to converse with the nobles and the officials and the priests, around verse number 17, Nehemiah tells them uh, that we are in trouble. Jerusalem is in trouble. Uh, the gates have been burned with fire and the walls are down. And so here is where the passion to change the narrative is revealed. Nehemiah then says, come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem uh, so we will no longer be in disgrace. And Nehemiah understood that the changing of the story would happen with the rebuilding of the wall. And this would remove
remove the disgrace from Israel. And so listen, the restructuring of the narrative of a Nehemiah uh, uh, started with his passion. Watch this to change uh, their situation. And so he has this enthusiasm, this zeal, and this eagerness to do uh, uh, what God had graced him to do. And Nehemiah teaches us, as I'm going to my seat, that when you have a passion to change the narrative, you'll be able to get it done and nothing is going to be able to stop you. And when you are in position to cover, what's built in you is a passion to change the narrative. And when we have a passion to change the narrative, marriages will be better. When we have a, a, a passion to change the narrative, our children will be better. When we have a passion to change the narrative, uh, churches will be better. When we have a passion to change the, our narrative, uh, our communities will be safer. Uh, when we have a passion to change our narratives, uh, fathers will then take their rightful place. Uh, when we have a passion to change the narrative, uh, our identity crisis will be dismantled. Uh, when we have a passion to change the narrative, uh, Satan won't win a another battle and is there anybody in the room tonight that would suggest I'm changing my narrative I'm not going to live how I'm living right now I'm going to change the very existence of my surroundings well Pastor Sprite give me an example and Jesus is waving his hand Jesus says I had to change the narrative Jesus says I was wounded for your transgressions I was bruised for your iniquities the chastisement of my peace uh, was upon you and by your stripes. Uh, I'm not talking about physical healing. Uh, I'm talking about the condition of sin. Uh, I'm talking about walking in ungodliness. Uh, I'm talking about walking in unrighteousness. Uh, he says my sacrifice uh, came so I could change the narrative. Uh, and is there anybody in the room tonight uh, that says I'm positioning myself to cover. I'm covering my family. Uh, I'm covering my children. Uh, I'm covering my wife. I'm covering myself. I'm covering those that are assigned to me. And never let the enemy stop you where you are. Because what he wants to do, he wants to distract you and cause you to miss out on what God has. But somebody shout, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I'm going to position myself and walk out in what God has for me. Come on, clap those hands and give God praise. I'm done. Y'all can sit down. I'm done. I'm done. Nehemiah teaches us that we have to be repositioned uh, to cover. Nehemiah says, watch this. My level of focus determined how I was moving. He says my level of focus was the, was the reason I was navigating through these particular areas because I needed to see what was going on. And the sad part about us is that we don't know what's going on because we're not focused. But we got to be like Nehemiah. We got to be focused because when we're focused, it determines how we move. And watch this. We got to be passionate.